Well, it was uh, an interesting experience uh, to um, be able to address the Commerce Committee in uh, Nashville. I really do appreciate uh, Senator Nicely for setting that up. Um, and I really do appreciate Tony Arterburn and Guard Goldsmith did an excellent job. Uh, Tony on Tuesday, as you know, and uh, with his guest, uh, Charlie Robinson and Guard Goldsmith with his guest, Eric Shiner of MRC TV, they covered very thoroughly January 6th and what uh, Tucker Carlson is doing. It's amazing to me. That's taken up the entire news cycle pretty much everywhere. So very important to talk about that. I, I've got a, just a couple of comments about that that I'll talk about later in the show. Uh, but Guard did such a uh, an excellent job covering that. There's not really anything to add to it. I just give my two cents worth here. Uh, but um, in terms of um, what happened with the uh, CBDC statement, which is why I was gone for a couple of days, uh, I really, uh, when, when I went there, it was the first time I've seen one of these proceedings. So I've never watched them before. The very first thing that happened, I had a 15-minute uh, speech to read to tie together the uh, state bank, a publicly owned state bank, along with CBDC. And as we're sitting there watching it, the very first guy who gets up to speak is an elderly doctor, retired, a uh, lot of experience, and he gets up and he starts talking about uh, some issue. I wasn't really sure exactly what he was saying because he didn't turn his mic on. And he went on for two or three minutes, and then the guy who was chairing the meeting gaveled him off really abruptly. And he goes, oh, okay, gets up, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, <clears throat> I, I don't know. <laughs> that was like two or three minutes. And I thought, do I need to shorten up what I have to say here? And um, again, uh, Senator Nicely told me many times, uh, 15 minutes, and, and uh, uh, but um, – the guy was in a real hurry. I mean, my what I had to say was at the very end of the meeting. And uh, so they had uh, a lot of business to cover. Typically what they do in these committees is they have uh, people who come in, have a bill that is going to be um, in their the area of that uh, committee, in this particular case, commerce. And so they would have other senators who would come in and they would uh, talk about their bill. And um, then they would have a vote as to whether or not it was going to be taken to the floor, whether or not it was going to get out of committee. And it was one after the other. I mean, the, the guy who was running the meeting, very good, very fast, very efficient, you know, this, this, and bang, 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 one thing after the other. I'm sitting there thinking, well, he's in a hurry today. And uh, <laughs> so I'm sitting there in my mind, I'm thinking, I've got to cut this thing down. I don't know that he's going to go full 15 minutes. And so I just, I, I cut straight to the chase of uh, CBDC and I didn't do a great deal in terms of trying to you know, relate the economic uh, conditions of where we are right now. The great job that the Federal Reserve has done over the last 110 years. You know, it's going to be the 110th anniversary this December. So we're not quite there at 110 years, but we're getting pretty close. They've done a fantastic job with the economy, haven't they? And with inflation and with any other metric that you want to put out there. Yeah, it is a coming storm. And Senator Nicely understands that, which is why, which is why he is trying to set up something at the state level that is going to give us a kind of parallel system. And that's what I really want to talk about. So I'll give you the speech here. Uh, maybe you can set your timer here and see if I make it in 15 minutes or not. <laughs> now I want to talk about the fact that we have a crisis situation here. And um, as I've said before, Chinese character for crisis is danger and opportunity. We obviously have a lot of danger in the financial system. You take a look at what uh, Powell is doing in terms of saying, well, you know, we're going to have to go even higher on interest rates. We're stuck between uh, a rock and a hard place between inflation that is getting out of control everywhere, every country, and with um, a recession and the way that they've been, been manipulating things. And so when you look at that, whether or not it is a, you see it as incompetence, or maliciousness, there is a malicious factor that is coming, and that's CBDC. <clears throat> now, we also have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to have an economic win for people at the state level, uh, for individuals, for small businesses, for farmers, even for small local banks who are going to go out of existence. Uh, <clears throat> this could be a big win if we have a publicly owned state bank and we do some of the other things in terms of uh, metals depository, having the state of Tennessee 
invest some money in gold and some of these other things. But, uh, and that'll be a good thing, even if this worst case scenario doesn't happen. But let's talk about the dangers of this stuff right now. So we look at it and this is for everybody worldwide. You know, we don't just have the problems, the old problems of inflation and recession. We have problems because we've weaponized the reserve status. We have a looming issue that uh, that could have a massive disruption to our economy. But all these things could be happening at the same time. So we all know about what the Federal Reserve has done with inflation, with a recession. If you go back and you look at the first, uh, at let's say 113 years, go 1800 to 1912, let's say, 112 years before the creation of the Federal Reserve. Do you know what the average inflation rate was? Negative 0.2%. It was slightly deflationary over that 110-year period, essentially. Now we've had a second 110 years. How has the Federal Reserve done it? Well, their average has been about 3.5% inflation. Now remember, central banks say the target is 2. So they're not doing too good there. And as a matter of fact, if you look at the last two years, it's over 5%. And if you look at the current rate, it is 6.5%. Now, those are numbers, those recent ones are fudged, of course, because they changed the way that inflation is calculated back in the 1990s. And we know that it is much, much higher. And when you look around the world, there are only four countries in the entire world where they're under the target rate of 2% inflation. And you have countries like Russia, 12%. Uh, many uh, European countries are, are much, much higher than that. Uh, you expect that Russia would be higher because of the economic sanctions, but Germany is at 9% inflation. And uh, that's in a country that has always been scared to death of inflation because of their experience with the Weimar Republic. Um, you have uh, Sweden, worse than Russia, at 13%. And so when you look at what is going to happen with the loss of the dollar's reserve status because of its weaponization, and it is coming, I mean, just in January, we had the Saudi finance minister at Davos say, well, we're going to be dealing directly with China and their currency, the yuan. Uh, we'll still deal with the dollar, but it's going to be one of many. Well, that's it. He declared the petrodollar is dead. Now, um, it's been declared dead, so we're just going to see how this is going to play out. But this is something that nobody alive, and they're, you know, well, you have some elderly people. 78 years since the end of World War II. and um, We've had a reserve currency status since then. Nearly lost it in the 70s. That's when they created the petrodollar, but it's going to uh, go again. So in living memory of people who are here, we don't know what it's like to have to be responsible for the money that we've incurred as debt. That's going to be a very, very different thing. And so as I said before, you know, we have this perfect storm of inflation, of inflating the money supply. And of course, you hear the uh, stats many times, anywhere from 35% to 80% of all the U.S. dollars ever created were created in the last two years. Now, that is something that uh, there's a lot of difference, and there's a big range in that number, because guess what? They changed the way they calculate M1 in 2020. Was that deliberate? Of course it was. They changed the way they calculate inflation. They changed the way... They have uh, manipulated the monetary, monetary supply uh, because they don't want you to see exactly what they're doing. However you calculate it, it is massive. And so you have these, these economic things that the Federal Reserve is doing, which have put us in this difficult situation. Then the policy of our government in terms of its unprecedented spending and now weaponizing to lose the reserve status, that part of it, is malicious, but the most malicious thing is CBDC. And um, as I said, the central banks of the world have done such a great job that they want even more power. And if you want to talk about federal overreach, talk about federal overreach into your pocket. Some have called it monetary totalitarianism. Some have called it surveillance disguised as money. I think of it as central bank digital control, not central bank digital currency. Uh, it is not the only path, as I pointed out last week, not the only path 
to getting to control. You look at biometric surveillance, and we'll talk about that with Paul Charest when he comes on, uh, what is happening in China. Uh, you know, you can have a de facto control with a social credit scores, with biometric surveillance, all done real time, all being looked at with artificial intelligence. And yet, you know, that, that is a path and that is a path that we are slow walking into. But if we go with CBDC, that is the direct path to the heart of the issue that does everything for them immediately. And so it still is, I think, uh, the, uh, the big issue. I know there's going to be a lot of pushback. There's been a lot of pushback in every country that has been there, but they are relentless and determined to do this. And so, um, you know, when we look at the, what is, what is happening in terms of these sanctions, as I said to them, I said, uh, I see central bank digital currency as sanctions on an individual basis. And as a result, I think we have to take a look at what some of the countries that are uh, our enemies or people who have been sanctioned or people who are being hurt by the sanctions, what are they doing to protect themselves against these sanctions? Because that's what needs to be done at the state level, and it's what we need to do as individuals. And so if you look at the, uh, what the responses have been to this weaponization of our reserve status, these sanctions that we've done, uh, the U.S., by the way, has done two-thirds of the world's sanctions since 1990. Uh, the 1990s. Sanctions now against 20 countries since 1998. And so with this blowback, what you see are uh, different countries, and that would include even countries that we are not in an adversarial relationship with, like India. They're still looking at ways that they can escape the influence and the power and the weaponization of the U.S. dollar, uh, the mismanagement of it, as well as the uh, malicious aspects of it. And so they're looking at ways that they can get out of the SWIFT network. How can they exchange money with each other? Of course, they are stockpiling gold. And they're also looking at having a currency that is backed by gold. A lot of those things are things that we can do as individuals. And the states can also help with that as well. And we need everybody in this as much as we can. That's why when we look at CBDC, this needs to not just be focused on individuals. We need to pull in local banks because they've got a target on their back as well. They don't realize it, but they're going to be dead in the water with it. Going straight to the Fed is what this is all about. So again, I see sanctions. Uh, I see the uh, CBD as uh, sanctions as a weapon against us. And how are they going to use it? Well, against individuals who are out of favor because of their political or religious beliefs. They'll use it against particular activities or products or ways of life. We have, um, <clears throat> and I've talked about this before on this program, <clears throat> the organization C40, Cities Climate Leadership Group. This was started in London in 2005. It's got uh, not 40 cities, but it now has 96 cities. And if you look at the cities that are involved in this, and of course they're focused on climate, and that's where a lot of these sanctions against activities and products and, of course, our way of life, that's where it's going to be coming from, based on climate. Uh, London, Tokyo, Paris, Hong Kong, Rome, etc. some largest cities around the world. In the U.S., 14 of those 96 cities. Uh, cities like New York, L.A., Chicago, Austin, Boston, Houston, Seattle, Portland, D.C., etc. You get the idea, you know, where they are on the political spectrum, right? So what are the goals of these cities? Again, I've mentioned this before. Uh, they got a couple of different levels. They got two different levels of goal. This is what we know we can achieve soon, and it's bad enough. But this is what their ultimate goal is: no meat, no dairy, one plane trip every three years of less than a thousand miles, three items of clothing per year, and of course, CBDC makes it possible for them to track or to block all of these things. But of course, there's other things that we know that they want to control. They've got a long list of things that they want to prohibit or control. Guns, obviously. Operation Choke Point from Obama has now been uh, taken to another level and weaponized with the new merchant codes. Discover will be using them beginning next month. And they have said other credit card companies are going to be doing the same thing. So with that, they can control your gun purchases, your ammunition purchases. It could all be easy and instantaneous with CBDC. Then, of course, there's speech. We saw that happen with Trudeau and the Freedom Convoy. 
We had at least one of the individuals who had their bank accounts frozen. Many people had their bank accounts frozen, even just because they donated money when it was legal. One example, I think one of the most egregious examples, it was pointed out by a conservative MP there, a uh, single mom uh, working a minimum wage job gave $50 to the Freedom Convoy and they froze her entire bank account. Well, of course, that's going to be child's play with CBDC. Your political, religious beliefs, your speech, PayPal, Venmo, the deputized state, they've done it to me. They have talked about even not just taking you off and deplatforming you, but giving you a $2,500 fine. They denied that that was their policy. They pulled it off, and then they put it back on again. It was always their policy. They don't make a mistake putting out a long legal document with terms of service. Of course, we've seen health prohibitions, and we've seen health mandates, and the CBDC will be used to do all of that as well. As a matter of fact, in some countries, the unvaccinated were banned from stores. They'll ban you from getting anything and everything. And then finally, we take a look at banning savings. Yes, that's what CBDCs are really going to be. That's one of the first things that these central bankers got excited about, how they could manipulate us, how they could keep us from saving money or accumulating any wealth to make cash expire in a certain time period, to impose negative interest rates, to bail you in to some kind of a financial disaster. In other words, just to steal your money directly. So in summary, these things, think of them in a sense as sanctions. Uh, Sanctions of political or religious belief, sanctions of food, travel, clothing, guns, ammo, speech, dissent, tobacco. Uh, California's got a bill to ban tobacco for anybody, for life, anybody that's uh, 16 years or younger now would never be able to buy tobacco. Uh, To... um, have sanctions against health care or to mandate health treatments, et cetera, et cetera. It goes on forever. 